Hi, my name is Emma Froh, and I'm an assistant professor at Arizona State University. Uh, I work, uh, I'm a social scientist, uh, and I work in a field called science and technology studies. And this is a field that is particularly interested in studying the practice of science in everyday life. So what scientists do, how they make knowledge, uh, how they share information, and how they relate uh, with others outside of the scientific community. So I've actually been studying synthetic biology and synthetic biologists now since about 2008, studying what they do, how they work, and how they engage with the rest of the world. So today we're going to talk uh, in broad terms uh, about synthetic biology in context. Um, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to essentially talk you through a chapter that I wrote with a colleague of mine, Jane Calvert, who's based at the University of Edinburgh. So we'll go through several examples today. At the end of the talk, I'll put the reference up uh, on a slide in case you're interested in reading more um, uh, and seeing other examples uh, about what we're going to talk about today. So synthetic biology is a field that has generated an awful lot of interest in the last 10 or 15 years. It's a fairly new field. So you might think 10 or 15 years is a long time, but when you're starting to build or when you're striving to build a new field from scratch, uh, it takes a lot of time and effort and resource to try and bring people together to create a vision that people will buy into uh, and to secure enough funding and resources to really start to build a community of practitioners uh, who, will, uh, who will sort of work to a common goal with you. So synthetic biology has actually been very successful in the last 15 years at doing exactly this, at raising its profile, at building awareness about the field, and at trying to enroll a number of practitioners into this new and growing community. So there has been uh, a lot of interest from the perspective of policymakers and research funders and other groups uh, to look at and to think about uh, synthetic biology and the types of visions uh, and the, the, the type of, uh, of technology that it's striving to produce. So over the past 10 or 15 years or so, as I said, there have been a whole host of reports that have been published about synthetic biology. This is just a snapshot of a, of a few. There are at least 100 or more reports that have been published by research funders, uh, by non-governmental organizations, uh, and by learned societies who are interested in thinking about what the future might look like uh, if we start developing synthetic biology. Now, it's very interesting that a lot of these reports don't just focus on the technical aspects of the field. They also are very keen to start thinking about some of the broader ethical and social issues that might be associated with the development of synthetic biology. And if we look across these reports, we see that they often raise a, a fairly similar pattern of issues uh, that they are concerned about regarding the social and ethical aspects of synthetic biology. So we see a number of recurring topics. And I think across the reports, there are four recurring topics that we see uh, fairly regularly. The first is a lot of discussion about the possible ethical implications. For example, if we uh, become able to create synthetic life. The second is often uh, a set of speculations about what the future benefits and harms of synthetic biology, biology might be if we get to a stage where it starts to become uh, a kind of much more viable technology. The third recurring topic is a reasonable amount of concern about whether or not the public will accept synthetic biology as a technology as and when it begins to develop. And the fourth is uh, a concern about how we might begin to go about regulating and evaluating the risk of new synthetic biology products that begin to come onto the market. So this set of four topics are, are ones that we see uh, occur over and over again in a number of the published reports on synthetic biology. What I'm going to suggest today is that actually we take a step back and we reframe the discussion slightly. So rather than focusing on, I'm not suggesting that those four topics are inappropriate or wrong topics, but what I'm suggesting is that the way that they're currently framed and phrased uh, can lead you into slightly difficult, tricky situations uh, and sort of dead ends when it comes to trying to open up a very productive conversation about synthetic biology. So what I'm going to suggest instead is that we come up with slightly different ways of beginning to open up conversations around these issues, creating a different space for discussing synthetic biology. And I'm going to do this by suggesting four shifts in how we talk about the broader social context for synthetic biology. 
The first shift I'm going to propose is one of changing our discussion from talking about the social implications or the downstream implications of synthetic biology to instead thinking about more of the social dimensions of synthetic biology. I'll explain a little bit more about what I mean by each of these shifts as we go through the lecture. The second shift that, uh, that my colleagues and I would like to advocate for is, is a shift from entering uh, kind of a great deal of speculation about the future of synthetic biology to doing a little bit more grounded anticipation uh, that's, that's based more in a real-time understanding of what is happening in the field as opposed to jumping too far forward into the future from the beginning. The third shift that I'd like to propose is moving away from discussions about whether or not the public will accept synthetic biology to instead thinking about synthetic biology as a possible technology for improving public good. Um, and the fourth shift that I'm going to advocate is one of um, moving from discussions about how we would regulate synthetic biology to how we would govern it. Now, you might look at this list here and say, this is just word games. It doesn't, you know, what, what, what difference does it make what words exactly we use to describe this? What I'm going to suggest, actually, though, is that these words really do matter. And I'm going to try and show you, going through each one of these in turn, what it looks like if we actually begin to shift the language that we're using to talking, for example, about dimensions instead of implications, and how that begins to change the space for our discussions of synthetic biology in context. So what we're going to do for the rest of the talk is go through each of these four shifts in turn. And I'm going to try and give you some examples to suggest why I think these are, uh, these are important shifts for us to try and adopt when we're thinking about synthetic biology in context. One thing I want to do very quickly first, though, is just take a very quick moment to, to reflect upon the kind of broad relationship between science and society. This is something that is much bigger than synthetic biology as a whole. It's much more about how we think about the relationship between science and society. I think very often there's a tendency to see science and society as two fairly different spheres, ones that don't interact very much, uh, where scientists are happily going about doing their work uh, and society either kind of uh, responds to or res uh, accepts or rejects scientific developments. And I'd like to suggest actually that, again, we sort of think about this in a slightly different way. First, we need to acknowledge and remember that science is part of society. And that's fairly obvious, right, when you stop and think about it. Science is, uh, a, it's, it's one way, it's one approach, uh, it's a, uh, within society, it's one approach to gathering knowledge in a systematic way, to organizing a community, and to learning about our world. In today's society, it's a very powerful way of learning about the world, but it's not the only way. So it's very clear that science operates within a broader societal context. Maybe less intuitive is the suggestion that, uh, that society is also part of science. Um, so it's, we're often very keen to sort of think that scientists really operate in a little bit of a bubble or a vacuum that's insulated from, uh, from sort of discussions uh, about, uh, with the rest of society. And actually, when you stop and think about it again, it becomes fairly clear that science uh, uh, as a body of knowledge is hugely influenced by and shaped by society in many ways. Everything from uh, the fact that different national, uh, different national contexts, different countries, uh, have different priorities when it comes to supporting science. So that sci the type of science that's done in any given place or in any given country or institution is really affected by um, what the priorities uh, at that particular moment in time are. So that you know, what we choose to ask as scientific questions is shaped by what society is interested in and values at a given moment in time. But also, we can, it's not just about the external pressures on science. It's also about the way that science as, uh, as, a, as a kind of, uh, as a community and as, a, as an institution structures itself. So, for example, there's a lot of discussion and debate at the moment about promoting gender diversity in science and especially recruiting more women into science. Well, actually, these kinds of discussions uh, are not unique to science. They actually have much broader historical and social contexts uh, relating to the role of women in the workplace um, uh, and kind of broader social and cultural concerns about gender diversity. So we can see that in many ways, actually, society is very much a part of science too. So all this is just to say that I think when we're talking about synthetic biology in context, what we're really doing is really trying to, to make it clear that actually science and society are not separate entities. They're deeply interwoven. So science is part of society. Society is part of science. And actually, as we go through the rest of the talk today, we'll really see, uh, I'll try and show you some examples of exactly how, um, uh, how deep these interconnections are. 
Okay, so as I said, this talk is really going to be about proposing a set of shifts uh, in how we begin to frame the, uh, our discussions of synthetic biology in context. And the first shift that I said we would talk about is one of uh, moving from discussions about the downstream implications of a technology like synthetic biology to thinking about its social dimensions. Uh, so there's actually a long history of referring to uh, the implications of developments in science and technology. And for the purposes of synthetic biology, probably the, the sort of most important precedent to draw upon is the Human Genome Project. So this is a project that was funded um, by, uh, by the US and, uh, and uh, British governments, along with a couple of other uh, countries that were heavily invested in sequencing the human genome. And it was a project that really took place across the 1990s. And what was really innovative about the Human Genome Project was that of the vast sums of money they were pouring into sequencing the human genome, they made an explicit decision to dedicate 5% of the funding for this project to studying what they called the ethical, legal, and social implications of sequencing the human genome. And this got shortened to the acronym ELSI. So this is an acronym that you will hear repeated um, uh, today when you hear about discussions of emerging technologies. So it was seen as very innovative to, to spend some money uh, uh, on thinking about the implications of what it would be like to sequence the human genome. Now, interestingly, this word implications suggests that uh, what we're really doing is saying, go ahead and sequence the human genome, and then we'll think about what the consequences of that might be afterwards. Um, so it really positions the ethics, the legal, and the social uh, issues as being downstream of the science, as being things that you worry about only once the science has been done, not something that you think about uh, maybe before you start doing the science or as you're working with the science. Um, and this is a criticism of the kind of ELSI label that has been picked up on uh, in different places. And so what we've seen actually over time is modifications of the ELSI label to try and adjust for this concern about leaving the ethics and the social to being downstream. So in different parts of the world, the ELSI label has been modified in different ways. In the UK, we often see the term LC referring to ethical, legal, and social issues rather than implications. On con in continental Europe, we often hear the term ELSA referring to ethical, legal, and social aspects. Again, uh, sort of not presenting it necessarily as downstream. Um, and in Canada, they've added a couple of extra E's into it. So they talk about ethical, environmental, economic, legal, and social issues um, to, to make sure that they're giving uh, enough uh, attention to what they see as some of the important broader uh, contextual issues associated um, with uh, emerging technologies. And actually, in synthetic biology, too, we see that there has been something of a shift away from this discussion around implications. Um, in the case of synthetic biology, we are seeing some groups adopt, uh, again, quite different labels, not even labels that look like the ELSI label, but that are much more concerned with, um, with uh, grappling in real time with some of the issues that are cropping up as the field is trying to build itself uh, and, uh, and as it's trying to secure a, a base of support and funding and so on. So there's a US research center in synthetic biology called SINBERG that some of you might know about. And there, the LC questions are often referred to as human practices or as practices questions. Again, this shift that, uh, that really gets us away from thinking about the downstream part of what happens after you've done the science to thinking about the actual practices involved in doing the science from conception of the idea right through uh, to the downstream implications. For those of you who might have heard of the iGEM competition or even have been involved in it, again, we see a, a, a label for the ELSI work that has become policy and practices. And again, this is very much about trying to draw our attention to some of the real-time questions that are emerging that scientists and engineers are grappling with um, and that uh, regulatory bodies and members of the public um, and lawyers and ethicists and everyone are starting to raise uh, as the science is beginning to take shape and form. So this is all just to say that uh, I think it's very productive for us to, to, to not fall into the trap of thinking about just the downstream implications of science and technology, that there can be a lot of merit to thinking about what happens in real time. So I think one really nice example of paying attention to the dimensions rather than the implications uh, of synthetic biology is to think about some of the metaphors that are currently in use within the field. So we see, for example, metaphors being borrowed from several different fields of engineering in synthetic biology. 
uh, we see uh, examples from electrical engineering where we're trying to uh, turn genetic um, uh, elements into circuits. So we're talking about input and output functions uh, uh, and, and building genetic, genetic circuits instead of electrical circuits. And we can see uh, in published papers about synthetic biology these kinds of diagrams that show us input and output functions. Uh, instead of using electrical wiring here, they're talking about these are all genetic components that they're, that they're uh, building into genetic circuits. So the equi genetic equivalents uh, of electrical components. And as we know with electrical circuitry, we can also program it to produce particular types of functions. So we're, again, we're seeing not just the idea that, uh, that genetic elements can be composed into circuits, but they can also be programmed to achieve certain outcomes. Um, so again, uh, there's been a lot of attention recently in synthetic biology to trying to build logic gates. So the, uh, uh, genetic equivalents of, of software logic gates. So this uh, figure down here, for example, is uh, an example of the architecture of a, of a logical AND gate using genetic circuitry, um, as well as the truth table that's involved uh, in building this circuit. We're also seeing analogies being brought from the field of mechanical engineering. So uh, some of you may have, uh, have heard discussions about using cells as chassis uh, for, uh, for uh, bolting your genetic circuits onto. So cells like uh, host organisms like E. coli or like yeast might be used uh, to drive the expression of the genetic circuit of interest uh, in order to produce your desired outcome. So I'd like to suggest that metaphors are actually very powerful things. And they raise a number of questions for us when we start thinking about what they're uh, what the implications are of adopting these metaphors uh, in, uh, within the context of synthetic biology. So for example, if we start thinking about cells in terms uh, like circuits uh, and chassis, do we, begin to under, do we begin to change our understanding of what cells actually are? Um, at the same time, uh, uh, are there limitations to the use of these metaphors? So for example, if we're referring to cells as chassis, um, but if we really think about what a, a car chassis is like, a car chassis is not uh, able to reproduce or to evolve in the same way that a cellular chassis might be. So this raises an interesting question. Is that is it fundamentally limiting our understanding uh, and if, we, if we think about cells as chassis? Or in fact, does it help us with our engineering project in synthetic biology by reminding us that what we're really trying to do is to limit the evolution and the reproduction um, of these chassis and to really make them as much like mechanical objects as possible. So metaphors are very powerful things in this regard. There's actually a sociologist of science called Susan Lee Starr who says explicitly that, that um, metaphors uh, lead to power. So uh, power is really about uh, whose metaphor ends up bringing different worlds together. And I think this is a really provocative statement for synthetic biology because we're seeing a number of different disciplines coming together. We're seeing engineers and computer scientists and biologists all entering the field. And I think it will be very interesting to see whose metaphors, whose ways of understanding the world prevail when we, um, uh, as, as the field kind of evolves and develops. We can already see in real time that the metaphors that are being used are shaping the types of research questions that are being asked, and therefore having some kind of influence over the types of applications that are likely to emerge. This is something that's happening in real time. So as I said, if we just think about the downstream implications of the technology, this is a set of questions that we're probably not likely to be paying attention to. But I would argue that they're questions that are really fundamental to how the technology is likely to develop over the next five to 10 years. Moving on now to the second shift, and it's a related shift in some ways. Uh, I said we were going to talk about uh, trying to shift the debate from, from speculating about the future to anticipating the future. So again, both of these words are words that engage with the future in different ways. Um, speculation is, one, is, a, is a term that's a little bit more, um, uh, uh, kind of a little bit more extreme in some ways, ventures further into the future uh, than, uh, than a kind of more grounded anticipation does. And I think often in the reports that we, that we hear uh, or that we read about synthetic biology, and especially in some of the news stories that we read, um, we see a kind of tendency to veer into speculation about what the future might hold. So just to give you a couple of examples about this, uh, two years ago in April 2013, um, National Geographic published uh, a, a special issue on de-extinction or the prospect of using uh, advanced genetic engineering technologies to do things like revive extinct species uh, or to try and rescue species that were uh, kind of very much at risk of becoming extinct. 
Now, there, this technology is beginning to be used on projects uh, to bring back species that have sort of recently become uh, very threatened or recently become extinct, like the passenger pigeon, which is a, a, a species that has uh, that sort of became extinct about 100 years ago, but we have a kind of strong historical and, and cultural connection with. But actually what we found in the discussions that ensued about this special issue uh, of National Geographic, there was a lot of public discussion and debate about it. Most of the discussion revolved around um, what would happen if we brought back woolly mammoths or Neanderthals. So really verging much further into the future than some of the existing, uh, than the kind of projects that were being worked on in real time. This is also an early example of some of the kind of speculative uh, art and architecture projects that were undertaken in thinking about what a future of synthetic biology might hold. This is a, a, an, an image of, of um, produced by an architectural studio based at MIT, uh, thinking about what, what future accommodation might look like in a synthetic biology world. Uh, again, we can see from this picture that it really is something that's kind of much further into the future than, than what our current living arrangements uh, look like. So, so the, the idea behind the shift is this. Many reports about synthetic biology are very quick to slip into the future tense. And discussion of the future is absolutely important, particularly when you're trying to set up a new field and you're trying to secure support and enthusiasm and investment in the field. So actually new fields really require a, a visionary momentum in order to, to command investment and, uh, and collaboration and, and bring people along with you. But, the one thing we want to kind of caution against is that um, promising too much, going too far into the future, can really distract us from paying close attention to the present um, and can kind of lead us to, to sort of enter discussions that in the long run aren't necessarily very productive. So I'm just going to give you a quick example here that relates to uh, some of the growing attention to the biosafety and biosecurity aspects of synthetic biology. So, so one of the key uh, interests of synthetic biologists is to try and make the engineering of biology faster, more reliable, and more predictable. In, in short, making it easier to engineer. And one of the motivations for making biology easier to engineer is to allow a wider number of people to participate in the field. So at some point in the future, you may not need to have a PhD or even a degree at all in molecular biology in order to undertake synthetic biology work. Um, and over the past decade or so, we've seen a number of groups who might be classified as amateurs in some way entering the field of synthetic biology and really trying to have a go um, at engineering with biology. So for example, we've seen the, the, the very rapid worldwide growth of, of an undergraduate competition in synthetic biology called iGEM. And we've also seen the growth um, of a do-it-yourself biology community uh, in several countries around the world, uh, amateurs who are getting together um, to specifically to develop technologies that will enable cheaper engineering um, of biological systems. Um, so there's, there's a worry, though, that accompanies the rise of, um, uh, of these kind of increasingly amateur groups into the field. And there's a worry in particular that this may lead to um, uh, implications for biosafety and biosecurity. So some of my colleagues at the London School of Economics have looked at the sorts of policy reports that I showed on the very first slide of this talk, and they've tried to analyze how these reports are talking about uh, the potential biosafety and biosecurity implications of the field. And they've identified what they call a number of myths about the field. And I'm just going to run through three of them. They have, an, they have several more myths, and you can uh, I'll, I've put the reference here, and the full reference will be at the end if you want to read more about this. But for example, they say that a lot of the reports talk about about how synthetic biology is de-skilling biology and making it easier for terrorists to exploit advances in the biosciences. A second myth, they say, that appears regularly, and it's related to the first one, is that synthetic biology is leading to the growth of a DIY bio community, and this could offer dual-use knowledge and tools and equipment for bioterrorists who are seeking to do harm. Another myth that they say occurs regularly in the literature is that DNA synthesis has become cheaper, it continues to become cheaper, um, and it's increasingly being outsourced, and that this in itself will make it easier for terrorists to access DNA and to create biological threat agents. Now, what my colleagues are saying is not that these are completely wrong, but that these, that these ideas about synthetic biology are sort of jumping ahead a little bit, are, are thinking about a future of synthetic biology that we're not dealing with yet. So they, say, so they offer a number of what they call challenges to these myths that are grounded in really looking at what's happening 
uh, within the field of synthetic biology in practice. So not saying um, uh, it is already cheaper, it is already faster, therefore these are threats, but saying if we look at what's happening now, what can we see? And they say, for example, that yes, DNA synthesis is becoming cheaper, has become cheaper, but at this stage, it's still not fully accurate and reliable. They also say that even once you get pieces of DNA, assembling DNA is a technical challenge. I don't know if any of you have tried this, um, but uh, depending on the DNA assembling methods you use, it can take a reasonable amount of time uh, to gain uh, expertise to be able to do this reliably. Um, and it's one thing to assemble pieces of DNA. It's a whole other uh, ball game to start thinking about how you might assemble DNA in order to create a new pathogen, for example. What my colleagues also point out is that members of the do-it-yourself biology community are already being very proactive in engaging with the safety and security concerns. Um, they're engaging with their local biosafety um, uh, uh, officers, um, they're making contacts with regulatory agencies, and so on, to try and make sure that the work that they're doing is grounded um, in a strong appreciation of safety and security issues. And finally, my colleagues point out then that a lot of the speculation around the, the future prospects of synthetic biology uh, for um, nefarious purposes uh, really focus on then how we can control um, who has access to the materials and supplies for doing synthetic biology. So, you know, it's all about getting cheap DNA faster, and what we really need to do is think about how we limit people's access to it. What the policy reports often don't focus on, which is something that you get if you really start looking in practice at what's going on in laboratories, is to say that actually really thinking too about the kinds of skills that are involved in the laboratory work, the type of knowledge that's required to execute synthetic biology projects, is really also something that we should be paying attention to from a policy perspective if we're interested in limiting uh, the potential biosafety and biosecurity hazards that could emerge from this technology. So nobody's saying that it's risk-free, but I think um, the idea is to, to not jump too far forward, but to be, grounding your, um, to, be, to be grounding your preparation, your policy recommendations, and your actions in a very good understanding of what's happening in the present, um, uh, and being very careful in how far you extrapolate that into the future. So the third shift that I want to propose is one where we, where we increasingly move away from talking about public acceptance of new technologies like synthetic biology to focusing more on the public good. Now, I can't tell you the number of times I've, I've heard scientists um, sort of lament or show concern about the fact that public acceptance of synthetic biology is really likely to be a big issue for the field. So this is something that seemed to be perhaps more of a threat to the field than actually some of the technical hurdles that, that are currently being faced. And often in these discussions about public acceptance of technology, you sort of get the, the, the feeling that um, scientists and regulators often assume that the reason that people don't accept new technologies is because they really don't understand them, because, because of a certain amount of ignorance about the details of the technology. And so the solution to this is often to, to assume that educating the public about the technology is the solution to our problems. So if only people would understand more about the science involved, we'd find that they'd be much, much happier to embrace the work that we're doing, our new developments in science and technology. This is something that I very often hear scientists talk about. Actually, this is a question that we can test empirically. We can ask the question, does more knowledge about science result in more public support for science? And this is a question that social scientists have now been exploring for 30 to 40 years. And across a whole host of studies that they've done, um, investigating this relationship between knowledge about science and support for science, they've come up with a very complex picture. This is really not straightforward. There is no linear correlation between how much knowledge you have of science and your support for science. So on the whole, what we see is that uh, kind of large-scale attempts to increase public knowledge about science have actually not led to widespread increases in public support for science. Um, in fact, countries and social groups that have more scientific knowledge are often not necessarily more positive about science and technology. So increasing science literacy is no guarantee um, uh, that you'll be more positive about science and technology. It will guarantee that you're better able to have a debate about it, perhaps, or that you're in a position to, uh, to make an informed decision based on your own values. Uh, but that may not necessarily correlate with uh, strong support for a proposed technology. In fact, in the case of genetically modified crops, which as some of you may know has been a particularly controversial issue in Europe, 
one of my colleagues has shown that there's evidence that the more knowledge people have about genetically modified crops, the more likely they are to adopt polarized positions. So either strongly supportive of or strongly opposed to, rather than meeting somewhere in the middle with a kind of, you know, a consensus on support for the technology. So actually, the more we teach people about science and technology is not a guarantee of, uh, of, of more public acceptance uh, uh, for, the, for the developments that scientists are pursuing. There's also a somewhat problematic assumption that risk is the key issue that the public is concerned about when it comes to new technologies. So in particular, there's a sense that the public really worries about the health and safety risks of proposed um, uh, new applications and new, new developments in science and technology. And as a result, there's, there's a lot of emphasis on the part of companies and scientists and regulators to do, undertake safety studies that really try and demonstrate uh, minimal risk or, or, or sort of lack of active harm uh, of, of the new products and technologies that they're developing. Again, this is a question that we can begin to ask empirically. If a technology is safe, does this mean that people are obliged to accept it? And actually, sort of a silly response to this would be, of course not. I mean, if I told you something like, steamed broccoli is safe to eat. That doesn't necessarily mean that this is a technology that you have to embrace and that you have to eat broccoli. There might be a host of other reasons why you would choose not to eat broccoli. And in fact, this is, these are, uh, very, this is uh, a kind of very similar to the types of lessons that we've learned from studying the, the controversies or the public debates around GM crops in the UK, uh, which happened over the last sort of 15 years or so. So when GM crops first started to come out, there was a strong assumption on the part of companies and regulators that the main public concerns relating to GM crops would be about the risks to the environment and perhaps to human health uh, if you were to eat GM crops and if you were to kind of uh, plant GM crops in a widespread manner. So there was a lot of emphasis on carrying out technical risk assessments about the environmental and uh, kind of health uh, risks associated with GM crops. The problem is that th these uh, reasonably narrow technical assessments uh, regarding safety didn't take into account a whole host of features that actually were of significant concern to the public uh, when it came to thinking about whether or not GM crops were, were a technology that they wanted to embrace. So for example, um, there was no scope within these assessments to discuss who would control these technologies, and in particular a sense that um, uh, a lot of GM crops were being promoted by reasonably large multinational companies who might then begin to control local agricultural systems. Uh, there's a long history of farming and food cultures in Europe that varies quite a lot across Europe as well, so a certain sense of, of this technology perhaps posing a threat to long-standing cultural and social histories around food. And also a question, a very legitimate question, I think, from customers about really what the benefits were uh, of these foods uh, should they choose to buy them. So not just about what the risks are, but what is a consumer to gain from buying a genetically modified tomato? Will it taste much better? Will it be much cheaper? What kinds of criteria are important to people when making these decisions? The problem is that because the, risk because the technical assessments were focused almost exclusively on evaluating risk uh, from an environmental and a health perspective, they weren't able to address some of these broader concerns that people had. So a lesson to draw from this is that it's really problematic to assume in advance that we know what will be important to people when they engage with new technologies. This is something that uh, regulators and policymakers are beginning to take on board. And what they're starting to do is to advocate a broad shift away from sort of one-way communication from uh, the top down to the public towards encouraging much more of a two-way dialogue about the prospects of a particular technology. And in the case of synthetic biology, I think this is perfectly justified. Because as we know, um, certainly from the policy reports and a lot of the kind of visions that have been put forward for this technology, synthetic biology really aims to serve broad social and economic goals. Um, social and economic goals are not the same as technical goals. Um, and so there's a, there is a legitimate question about who should be allowed to have a say and a voice in prioritizing among those goals, and an argument uh, that, that wider groups of people should be um, involved in discussing what these goals should be. <sighs> And this leads us to a discussion of the public good rather than public acceptance. So when we think about uh, why we're uh, promoting the use of a particular technology, maybe we need to start thinking not so much about whether people will accept it, but what benefits it will bring and how it will best serve the public good. The problem is this is a slightly thorny issue. 
At some level, we all have an intuitive grasp of what the public good means, but we have to remember this isn't a static, unchanging concept. There's no one single definition of exactly what the public good means. This is a context-dependent thing. What might be good for one country at one particular point in time may not serve uh, another country as well. Or there might be different, uh, different groups, different, uh, different interest groups within society who see a technology as having um, particular advantages or disadvantages for them. So what drawing our attention to the public good does is it really shows us that discussing the benefits, the risks, um, and, uh, and the opportunities associated with new technologies is something that requires ongoing dialogue and negotiation in the public sphere. It's not something that any one group has the authority to decide. It needs to be debated continuously by a broad range of groups. And this leads me, I think, quite nicely into the final shift that I wanted to advocate, which is one where we uh, really focus on thinking about the governance of synthetic biology rather than thinking exclusively about how we would go about regulating it. So again, often when I go to uh, meetings and conferences on synthetic biology, at some point during the day, the conversation uh, turns to a discussion of whether or not synthetic biology is really something new. Um, is it, uh, you know, is it a new and revolutionary technology, or is it really an extension of existing technologies like industrial biotechnology or metabolic engineering or even systems biology? And, and these debates uh, rarely get resolved um, because people around the room have very different views about exactly where this technology fits in with the spectrum of other things uh, that scientists are currently working on. But it does have ramifications for how we might go about uh, kind of regulating or governing the technology. If synthetic biology really is a new and revolutionary technology, does this mean it needs new regulations? Um, uh, and if it, if it isn't as new and if it isn't quite as revolutionary um, as that, are there existing models that we can borrow from that would help us to um, make determinations uh, about how different applications and products should be regulated? I think a lot of the sort of one of the issues with these types of discussions is that they really focus on how the technology should be regulated. So whether or not it should be allowed um, uh, or not allowed to say enter the market. I think sometimes in these discussions it can be very useful to start thinking about um, uh, not just the regulation of synthetic biology, but more broadly speaking, the governance. Now governance is a kind of, again, a term or an idea that emerged around the same time as discussions of public dialogue with synthetic biology instead of just public acceptance, around the early 2000s. And this was really a time when we were trying to, policymakers were trying to get away from uh, just thinking about the, the top-down, expert-driven approaches to policymaking and thinking a little bit more about how to involve broader groups of stakeholders um, to deliberate the merits um, uh, and the, the, the place of new technologies in our world. And so, you know, again, it's a, it might be a subtle shift in words, but the idea of governance really draws our attention to the many different groups that are currently playing a role in shaping the field of synthetic biology. Um, uh, and just to show you a snapshot, this is a small snapshot, but just to give you a sense of the types of players that might be involved, at the moment already, 10 years in, 15 years into the field, we're seeing that there are a whole spectrum of groups who are playing a role in shaping what synthetic biology looks like today. So for example, we have funding agencies uh, in different countries who are making investments into uh, sort of science and engineering projects. Uh, we have um, the centers, the research centers that they're funding, and some of the consortiums and organizations and individual labs that are receiving the research funds. We also have uh, companies that are springing up that are uh, working in synthetic biology. And these may be large and established companies like ExxonMobil, or they may be companies uh, that are sort of somewhat newer to the scene, um, starting up in, in various uh, parts of the world. We also have the emergence, as we talked about earlier, of uh, kind of uh, amateur groups who are increasingly getting involved in wanting to engineer with biology. Um, and there are uh, non-governmental organizations, civil society groups, and often uh, patient activist groups who are also getting involved and trying to um, argue their own cases for how the field should or should not develop. Um, so all of these groups are playing a role in what the configuration of synthetic biology currently looks like. And this, isn't, this is um, not to forget the role uh, that institutions like patent offices can also have in shaping a field. So decisions that get made um, about which, uh, uh, which processes, which applications um, are, are worthy of patents or, or should not be patented will actually have a large ramification for how the field as a whole develops. Now, issuing a patent is not typically considered um, uh, within the remit of talking about things in terms of regulation. Um, but I would argue that uh, 
Patenting, for example, is a very important topic that uh, stands to shape the field significantly. Um, and on top of all of this, we know that different countries have different, uh, different configurations of companies and research funders and so on, um, and that they also have different histories and traditions of, of uh, working with new technologies, of thinking about um, uh, how to decide whether or not uh, to, to promote particular technologies um, or to, to fund certain types of applications over others. So this actually becomes a much more complicated picture than thinking about a very narrow uh, uh, discussion of whether or not we should allow a particular product into the market by, uh, by imposing certain regulations on it. Um, it might seem complicated, it might seem overwhelming, but actually I would argue that it opens up a much bigger space for us to begin intervening into thinking about how we would like the culture of this field to develop. And let's not forget, too, that synthetic biology as a field itself is hugely interdisciplinary. So already we're seeing the involvement of um, uh, natural scientists and engineers and computer scientists from a variety of different um, uh, academic backgrounds. We're seeing economists and lawyers getting involved. We're seeing sociologists and philosophers and ethicists. We're also increasingly seeing uh, artists and designers taking part in the field. Um, and, and just the fact that there is this kind of amount of interdisciplinary dialogue going on where people are really trying to work together and develop common ground can have a significant, significant influence on the culture of the field. Um, I would say that the very fact that you're watching this talk, if you have made it through this far, shows that you also um, uh, can and should have a role in shaping the field of synthetic biology, uh, whether you're actively involved and in practicing in the field or whether uh, it's something that you just have a, an interest in. Um, uh, this means that, that, uh, that uh, you can and should have a role in shaping what you, uh, what you would like to see happen with the field of synthetic biology. Um, so I think uh, thinking about um, uh, the idea of governance rather than regulation really encourages us all to think about what we would like our roles to be and to think about how we might shape a culture and a system um, uh, and the kinds of actual tools at our disposal to, to work from the bottom up, not just from the top down. Um, so that's just the end, uh, you know, that's, that's the end of uh, what, I, what I was planning to say today. Um, and essentially just to summarize that, you know, I think that the way that policy reports uh, and discussions so far about synthetic biology have been framing some of the, the broader contextual issues sometimes get a little bit um, uh, uh, trapped um, by the language and the framing that they're using. And so what I've tried to do today is to advocate for shifts in how we think about and how we discuss synthetic biology in a way that I hope will begin to open up a bigger space for conversation that offers us more opportunities to, um, to think about and to engage productively um, and to really shape the future of the field constructively. So, um, so when you come across uh, news articles and reports and stories about synthetic biology, you know, I think it's really worthwhile stopping and taking a minute to reflect on, um, on how, how, how the stories are being framed, whether they're focusing on implications or whether they're really tackling the dimensions of synthetic biology, um, how far they're veering into speculating about the field or the extent to which they're grounding their discussion in, in, a, um, uh, in, a, in a much more present sense of what's going on, uh, whether they're expressing active concern about public acceptance of the technology or whether they're not seeing the public so much as a problem um, but as a uh, as, uh, uh, a group to celebrate and, and as, a, as uh, a hope to try and, and benefit uh, the public rather than seeing them as an obstacle to the technology. Um, and whether they're, whether they're discussing synthetic biology as a technology that needs to be regulated or whether they're opening it up to a broader discussion of governance. So as I mentioned, a lot of these ideas and more details and more examples are available in a book chapter that my colleague Jane Calvert and I wrote. The reference details are available here if you're interested. Um, and I've also listed all the references that I mentioned in the talk in case you're interested in following up um, on any of them um, uh, because you have particular interests in that area. So thanks very much for listening. <laughs>